address for the record and what can we what, what would you like to tell us you hear me yeah all right uh sean mckenna 1402 south avenue so um first of all i've been enjoying the conversation and the questions and the comments from the commission can you speak louder i can't hear you sean yeah i think somebody everybody else may be out of mute because there is somebody that has a lot of motorcycles going around um i i do just want to point out that that you know, can't hear him and um sean come a little closer to your computer I don't know if i can get any closer to my computer all right is that better yes nope. all right so plainfield has 10 i don't know it is Plainfield has 10 historic districts and, and rough math, I've got 60 or 70% of them in my, the district, the ward that I represent. Um, Crescent is a very unique historic district, in my opinion. I'm an Iowa boy by birth and upbringing. Uh, it's got a river town feel by the architecture, by the, by the layout of the streets. It's unique, it's interesting. Um, it is way more populated than Mr. Martini uh, came up with, and and that is because it is it is neglected uh, by the city uh, uh, zoning and code enforcement. Um, there are a lot of illegal apartments in that area, uh, so the 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 density there is 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 already way over what it should be. Um, we pride ourselves in Plainfield on our historic districts, as we should. We have beautiful historic districts. We have very engaged historic districts. We just last year approved a master plan, an updated master plan, and the use of historic history, preserve and preservation were used 139 times out of a 300 page, 300 page document. Open space was used 150 times. Just those terms alone, we're not meeting this with these bulk standards. We're not doing it. There are properties over there, and, and Mr. Martini, I'm very familiar with. He's a very nice guy. When I was on the planning board, they presented uh, from Nishuan a lot, or Nishuan. I, I always did struggle with the pronunciation, um, and I think he means well. The reality is we know there is a developer who has a plan for these three lots. The reason we know this is that they bought 24 and 26 from the city. They already own 25. So they're all privately owned now. And by the way, the two that were not collecting taxes are collecting taxes. So we're already money ahead. So we shouldn't really focus on that too much, right? Um, but the reality is in our master plan, we talk about history, pre preservation, historic so many times. We talk about how our unique historic neighborhoods of Plainfield are the crown jewel of the community, how the prominent elements of retaining and reinforcing the character of the city is involved in these historic districts. We have the Historic Preservation Board Commission, pardon me, that does a great job of trying to preserve these elements. Crescent has some high densities. That is true. Even if you look at the tax records, some of those densities were created before the district was created, before the Historic Preservation Commission was created. So that does not mean that that's what we're looking for. That means what was created. It's a pre-existing non-conforming condition. There are other elements that have been, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, built and then they're kind of abortions of what was created before. They're overpopulated, they've been cut up, the, the facades have been destroyed. This, the, what we're trying to not do is mimic what is there. We're trying to preserve and return to a density that is appropriate for that area. 20 units per acre is inappropriate for the area, without a doubt. The other side to this is that we do know, we do know, let's, let's be transparent about it, that the tail is wagging the dog. There is a developer that has an interest. They own these three lots. They wanna do something with them. I don't have a problem with backing into a redevelopment plan. I have been very, very, very public about that. However, we don't back into a redevelopment plan just because all development is good development because that is not the actual case. By the time you get to a site plan for the HPC, and I've never served on the HPC, but I have watched you many times and I admire what you do. I, have, I was on the planning board for seven years. By the time you get to a site plan and an application, 
the redevelopment plan has already locked you into a certain point. And, and Vice Chairman uh, Quirk was, was, was hitting on this is that by the time that plan gets to you, you're 80, 75, 85, 90% locked in. There isn't much room you have. And then the arm twisting starts and you're kind of giving and taking and horse trading, which is okay, that's part of the deal, but you end up with subpar for the community because this is where the rubber hits the road right now. This is where the rubber hits the road. When you have these bulk standards, which 30, which Mr. Martini said, they pretty much all match what was there before. I always said when I was on the, on the planning board, don't give me what you're requesting, give me what you're requesting and give me what is current. Show me the red line. Would know, uh, wrap it up, please. I absolutely will. 31% of these bulk standards deviate substantially from what is currently on the books for the RCA zone that is there. One of which is the maximum um, building coverage, which goes from 30% from 25% to 30%. Impervious coverage goes from 35% to 60%. And as many of you noted, the dwellings per acre, dwelling units per acre, Go, it increases five times. This is not an appropriate uh, redevelopment plan for this area. It is not. I would really like to see some really nice townhouses. Uh, I, I, I'm fine with with um, two family dwellings in this area, which could be vertical uh, townhome um, developments. Townhomes are are hot right now. Vertical developments are hot. Vertical living and vertical uh, duplexes, I guess you could call them, are, are in vogue. And I think a lot of people that would like to downsize and have less space but stay in the area could use spaces like this. And we don't have them in our community. So I, I would highly encourage um, the, the commission to, to reject this and to send this back. And, I, and, and again, I don't have a problem backing into a redevelopment plan. I have a problem backing into a bad redevelopment. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Mary, I, I saw your hand up and now I don't. So Rich, you can go next. Name and address for the record, please. Uh, Rich Sudol, 313 Franklin Place, Plainfield, New Jersey, 07060. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about density because you guys kind of uh, beat that like a dead horse already. Um, <laughs> But along with the density comes in um, other conditions such as parking. And I know Mr. Martini had mentioned, he showed his nice map with the dwelling units per acre. Um, and most of those that show a higher density unit, um, some of the larger single family homes that have been cut up to five or six families, um, when you start looking at that, um, those were built as a single family home. They don't have the parking lot behind it. Um, those people park on the streets. If you drive down East 9th, Crescent Ave, first place, second place, third place, you will notice any time of the day, every space on the street is, is packed with cars. Um, those homes may be denser than they should be, than they were originally designed to. And with that density comes parking issues. Um, those properties are smaller, so they don't have the parking requirements behind it. Um, so that lends people parking in the street. Um, we have fought for years and the council finally approved one side of the street parking. So thankfully, um, fire trucks, uh, ambulances, DPW can actually get through first, second and third place, uh, to plow the streets, uh, which are now drivable even after this last storm. Um, you know, but then you have people throwing snow back into the street. Um, another issue with the parking is the, they were specifically designed to park on one side of East 9th on the inside street. Um, nobody stays 25 feet from the corner. Cops do not issue tickets for this. I don't know how many accidents I have seen at the corner of 2nd and East 9th, people trying to park, uh, pull out of second place and getting T-boned because they can't see around because the cars are parked so close to the corner. So parking becomes a huge issue when you increase density. And when you start looking at the bulk and area standards that are um, requested in this amendment, increasing the density to 20 units per acre, you're also increasing the impervious coverage to 60%, where Crescent area is 35%. You are now making the back of this unit 
a parking lot, which takes away from the green space, um, the lawns, the trees in the backyard that you see common throughout this community um, and in this neighborhood. And another part was reducing the, um, the parking requirements to 1.5 spaces per unit. You're going to put in, if it's proposed, um, if you look at the RSIS standards, you know, if you're proposing a two-bedroom apartment, you know, that's a requirement of, you know, uh, two parking spaces per, per unit. So we're going to cut that in half in conjunction with an overpopulated community already that's over densely populated that doesn't have enough parking to begin with. And those people are going to be forced to park on the street. Um, we already don't have enough street parking. Every space is full. Um, so that's going to be one of the issues that you, you come into with this. Um, and just having uh, a larger lot size covered um, impervious coverage um, is just taking away from the, the open space that you do see in the community, um, you know, as you go down that street there. Um, I would also like to see on your dwelling units per acre map, I noticed that you picked some of the largest houses on East 9th to draw your density from. Um, I would like to see that map complete throughout the entire Crescent District um, because there are smaller homes on the inside streets that don't have um, the six unit, seven unit density um, down to, you know, um, you know, maybe a two family. Um, but also considering the fact that the neighboring district um, behind these lots on Carnegie is an R3 district with a even smaller density. If you go down Carnegie, those are all single family homes, mostly one or two story Cape Cods, um, nothing fancy, but big yards, small house and a smaller density. Now you're going to increase the density right behind these people. Um, and it's it's kind of smack in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Um, you know, and, and you guys have all pointed out good things about the density, but you know, with the density comes the parking issues, um, the trash, the litter, all that stuff that we fight with, with PMUA to get our streets sweeped. Um, just all the cans that are still sitting out on the curb, the cardboard that doesn't get picked up and gets blown down the street. All those are issues that come in when you have a over densely populated area, which is what we have. Um, so thank you for letting me say that. And, um, I'll listen to everybody else's comments. Oh, one more comment. Um, and this is just in general. Um, and it's not specific to the HPC, but I do want to point out that um, if you go to the city's websites, I know planning board, zoning board, HPC have all had their reorganization meetings in January. A schedule is agreed upon. You cannot find any meeting schedule on the city of Plainfield website. The, all the information for today's meeting was posted this morning. It wasn't up there last week. So to, to do service to the citizens of Plainfield, we need to get the information up onto the website or at least the meeting dates on the city calendar. There are no um, board meetings, uh, whether it's planning, zoning, HPC meetings, none of those are on the city calendar. Um, HPC meeting just popped up today on the city calendar. Um, so most residents won't know about it if they look the calendar um, if you guys don't update that. So whoever takes care of the website, um, just wanted to point that out. It wasn't any of us, I'll tell you that. We thought it had been taken care of in time. All right. Um, I had a thought about parking. I just want to throw this out. I noticed this at a, on another application. I, I would suggest making a condition here of uh, if, if there's ultimately a parking variance to be granted to pr prohibit the management from ever charging the tenants for parking. I've seen it too many times. People don't want to pay for it. They would rather park on the street and we have to avoid that here. Uh, uh, Chairman, the, we have an ordinance that says that uh, the land, uh, landlord can't charge uh, the tenants for parking. So if you have incidences that you know about, let me know about it offline. Um, that's okay. I'll see. Come over to Central and Ninth, Valerie. Okay, Central and Ninth. <laughs> All right. Um, next person who had a hand up, Mary Bergwinkle. Name and address for the record, please. What happened to her? She just fell off my list again. Jeanette was the next one. I already allowed her to speak. Oh, all right. I, Mary fell off and I was putting her back. All right. Uh, Jeanette, I don't have a last name on that one. 
Identify yourself, please. Name and address for the record. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jeanette Crishone. I live at 1410 Evergreen Avenue in Plainfield. Hi, how is everyone? Glad to see everyone's well. Um, I just have a few points that I would like to make. Um, the first that that I would like, the first point I'd like to make is, I certainly hope that you really do take into consideration the taxpayers in that area who moved into that area expecting a certain type of environment, type of of lifestyle. Um, and they will be greatly impacted by whatever is done on the, these lots. And so I, I truly hope that you weight heavily uh, their opinions. The second point that I'd like to make is it always makes me really uncomfortable when I hear about new units going in and more dwelling units going in. The reason for that is, number one, you know, if you look at the city website, there are like a couple hundred thousand square feet in units that are being built, Muhlenberg being the biggest one. Um, and then there are other ancillary ones that haven't been built yet, are expected to be built and are not occupied. I don't know where you're thinking, well, these people are coming from. And that's not including some of the private developers. Um, what concerns me is you have what I consider prime space across from the Netherwood station. You have retail and you have living uh, apartments. They're empty. So now you're talking about not only building in um, the historic district, but overbuilding in the historic, in the historic built district. Um, that frightens the heck out of me as a resident of Plainfield whose property values are very much tied to the city itself. Um, the, the other thing that I would just like to ask, I don't necessarily need a, 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 an answer immediately, but 60% of lot coverage seems like a lot to me. I mean, you know, where where are your flower beds and where is your parking? And um, is that standard? What What is the standard? 60% lot coverage um, just seems a lot. Um, another point that I would like to make, it makes me crazy hearing statistics like this, 1.5 parking spaces. And I don't know if that's per unit, per person, but who has half a car? Like, why, why can you not come up with, you're talking about two family, three family, multiple dwellings. Um, how, how can you, 1.5 what? Like, you should be able to come up with, with, you know, we have two families, two parking spots, multiple dwellings, five parking spots. I mean, people in that area are going to be highly affected by the number of parking spots that are going to be allocated. And 1.5 is not, in my opinion, a realistic number. Um, the uh, other thing that I would like to just add is, I know that the boxes with the driveways on the side are not a correct rendering, but it seems as though that, that so my question is why not? Like, why didn't someone put some thought into it and say, okay, we're going to put a nice house here and the driveway is going to be in the back? Um, it's not at that point yet. Okay, okay. There, there has not as, been an application that, that shows site plan or buildings at all. Okay. But you know what, Bill? If you're comfortable with that, I'm comfortable with that. Because... I'm not. <laughs> but I'm telling you what's before us and what okay. is. Well, then I would like to go on record to say, Mr. Martini, Two boxes with driveways on either side is not something that you would see in, in Montclair and is not something that you should see in the historic district of Plainfield. Um, and my very last comment is I, I truly appreciate the idea that you want to build something and bring in tax revenues. Listen, we're all for let's reduce taxes, but redevelopment at any cost is is not appropriate. You know, it's been empty for 40 years, but the integrity of the Crescent um, Historic District has been left intact. To my mind, it's better that 
than putting something in there that is going to erode the value of the homes and um, and not present the, the uh, historic district in its best light. Thank you. Okay. Um, Aliqua, I thought I was the one that gets to say who goes next. I'd like to put Mary Birdwinkle in. She was on the list before. Thank you, Bill. Mary Birdwinkle, 1785 Sleepy Hollow Lane. I'll get in and out of this quickly. Um, I'm concerned about East 9th Street. Um, while I understand about the benefits of infill development and increasing the tax base, um, this plan is to go from moderate to high density in an area that's already densely populated and in a historic district. It would be a shame for the city to approve a dense, unattractive, multifamily structure not in keeping with the character of the neighborhood with insufficient parking and green space just because that is what developers want to build. Also, developers here have been known from time to time to get an approval based on elevations and finishes presented and then build structures that do not apply. So I hope the commission will be vigilant about that. Um, I hope that the snow this winter and COVID-19 have demonstrated that people need to store their vehicles and get outside. Once again, no one owns one, no one owns 1 1.5 vehicles. Um, and if that's not lost in the city this winter, because I've gotten a number of robocalls begging people to take their cars off the streets and put them in city parking lots if they can't park them. So that is a real problem that the city always poo-poos every time you talk about it. Um, our master plan gives at least lip service to maintaining the character and density of established neighborhoods. Please don't allow this property to develop, be developed in an insensitive manner to the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, the next. Next. Okay, uh, unmute yourself, Arna, name and address for the record. Arna Acre, 915 Madison Avenue. Uh, I live in a, a neighboring historic district just to the west of Crescent. And I am afraid that if you allow high density in Crescent with spot density allowable, uh, it, it's going to set a precedent for our district as well and other historic districts. And that this is not something that will encourage um, investment in the historic districts and upkeep by current owners. Um, I saw in our, our own district that prior to an HPC, a major uh, development was built uh, many, many years ago on Central Avenue and 9th Street, and nothing on that block has uh, taken off uh, because of the high density of those uh, units and the parking that's on the street because of those units uh, and visitors they have, it's nearly impossible for the fire department to get down those streets. Um, I think it would be a sham that um, the city would uh, approve this uh, with such a high density. I also questioning and look forward to Nishan confirming how they calculated the density. You know, we got uh, one member of the board here uh, that lives in one of those houses, Bill Garrett. I don't know what you consider the density in on that particular property that that I don't, you know, that it's a, I believe Bill lives in that house by himself. It's one, one dwelling unit in there. I don't know what you had it recorded. And then there's, it was another house, which I, I think I saw 17 dwelling units per acre. And that is a house on the corner of Ninth and Second uh, Street, which uh, is, was just sold. And it's now a one dwelling unit. And I, th I thought I saw 17 dwelling units per acre. So a lot of that uh, is a bunch of smoke and mirrors uh that data presented and does not the board should not count on that slide as being reputable thank you okay i see corey next <clears throat> hi everybody can you hear me 
Yes, go ahead. Thank, thank you, HBC commissioners, for your service. I, I, I appreciate what you all said tonight. And Name and address for the record, always. And you're muted again now. How about, okay. Go ahead. Storage 705 Ravine Road. So I just want to uh, speak in support of what a lot of the commissioners said and all the members of the public who've spoken so far. So I'm not going to get into any details about the parking and the density. I do want to say this this process for this for this particular uh, group of properties reflects uh, a new approach to redevelopment in Plainfield. I think it's very overbalanced towards the needs of developers. And you know, having been part of the process, I, I have to say we do need to address the needs of developers. Otherwise, we're not going to get any development. But it's going to be balanced with the needs of neighbors, and I do not see that happening right now. We've outsourced our planning department. No disrespect to Nisha Wayne, but they, you know they're not connected to Plainfield. Uh, you know, at the planning board meeting, we're starting to use spot zoning, which is what happened here. Uh, and not to the benefit of the neighbors. It's really to the benefit of a single developer. So 20 units per acre just is not a balanced approach. So if we, I would love to see the HBC uh, send to the planning board and the city in general, uh, like a specific proposal, not just a general concern, but something, for example, uh, maybe two buildings, maybe two or maybe three buildings, but maybe each building would have three units, maybe maybe like a total of eight. I'm going to uh, address all that. Units. What's that? I'm going to address that. Okay. Yeah, maybe like eight units right. um, for, the, for the whole property. And what, what that would accomplish, it would, it would go a long way to addressing the on-street parking problem. And no matter what our professionals are going to say about the parking situation, because I know from my experience on the planning board, like even the Quinn, with a lot of parking, has on-street parking now on on, um, on South Avenue. There's just no way around it. People are going to have a car, even if maybe they'll use it less in, in a transit area, but they're, gonna, they're still going to have a lot of cars. So 20 units is just going to be a real detriment. And you know, other people have explained more details on that. So please, HBC, consider coming in with a proposal back to the city, and I encourage all of you um, residents to keep talking about this. Certainly when the planning board, if, if they're going to look at a site plan, we should all go back there and be very strong about what we want to see. Because the planning board right now, having been on it and seeing them in action now, I don't think they're doing enough to address the needs of the neighbors and the neighborhoods. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Evan, I see you next. Name and address for the record, please. Unmute. Go ahead. Eight two four third place. And thank you for allowing me to speak. I live in the Crescent Historic District. I'm right around the corner from this proposed. It's Bill, I didn't. I didn't hear her name. Yeah, you you, you said it when uh, you were still muted. Evan, start over, please. Evan Michelson. Eight two four. Third place. No relation. Good, good <laughs> no, but we spell it the same way. So um, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I live in the Crescent District. I am around the corner from the proposed development. And uh, I actually went to grade school here in Plainfield in the late 70s, early 80s. And when I had to choose where I was going to move, um, I chose Plainfield and I chose the Crescent Historic District because I remember how beautiful it was. Yeah. And it, it's a, it's these historic districts are Plainfield's crown jewels. I moved here for the historic district. I know other people who moved here for the historic district. When I moved here 12 years ago, there were more multi-unit homes that have been converted back into single family. And that's good for the neighborhood. And that's good for attracting people who want to live in this neighborhood. And this feels like an attack on the historic districts. It, it's extremely short-sighted. Plainfield is a beautiful city. I chose to live here because it's beautiful, because it has access to mass transit, because um, there's a lot of there are a lot of things here that are very promising, and um, it's great to see 
that there's attention being paid to redevelopment in certain areas near the train stations, but it's going to ruin the feel of this district. I won't say anything about density because everyone else has done such a good job, but I live next door to a home that was illegally broken up into multiple apartments. And it was a heck of a job getting the city in here and setting that to rights. So uh, just count me in with all my neighbors and a lot of people who have spoken so eloquently on the board that this is short-sighted, it's a bad move, and um, Plainfield's historic districts are its crown jewel. And that's why people come here, and that's why we enjoy such a, a high quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. I see Jerry next. Hi, my name is Jerry Height. 915 Madison Avenue, Plainfield. Uh, there are two things I wanted to point out here. One is that I've always appreciated the scale of the Crescent Avenue Historic District with the, uh, the Victorian townhomes, uh, the little front yards. It has a coziness to it that you find it sometimes in cities, but there is a unique coziness to that area where you, you know, you had the idea that neighbors used to like know each other and uh, that it was a kind of a cohesive neighborhood. I live in the Van Wert Brooks Historic District and we have a different feel to us because in our historic district, we have larger homes and larger lots, but that particular stretch of East 9th Street has that specific kind of ambience. So, I don't see how 20 units could keep that ambience as it is. And my second point is that being in the Benwick Brooks Historic District, I'm pretty close to Library Park, which makes me pretty close to the train station. And after hearing about the redevelopment of designation of this property, I have a fear that if there is a fire here and a couple of the houses are taken away and we have some rather large lots here, that bingo, it's going to be a redevelopment area and I could be living near a parking of, of, of an apartment building with a parking lot and have the beautiful leafy yards that we have here taken away because there are apartment buildings within a block two blocks of me. By the way, they have been paying for their parking for some years now, which is why our streets are all clogged up with cars and people who have, I'm just going to throw this in because this is the parking issue it has nothing to do with this project. No, I raised it and you're correct. Yeah, but what happens typically is that people clean out their cars while they're parked at the curb. Cars are parked at the curb when the street cleaners come so they can't clean the streets. So if you walk down Central Avenue now, between 8th Street and 9th Street, you will see a massive amount of garbage. Well, now it's mixed up with snow, mixed up with the leaves, because I've walked my dog there. And it's, I feel sorry for the people who live there, because this is a real mess. And it started when the owners of these apartment buildings required them to pay for parking and probably also because they don't have enough parking spaces. So you find that over on West 9th Street, over on East 9th Street too. So those are my two objections, the density and how it's going to um, change that whole ambiance of the area. It's more of an architectural ambiance and um, the, of the parking issue. So um, that's it, I'm done. Thank you. I see Maria next. Unmute, name and address for the record. Uh, hi, good evening, Maria Pelham, 829 Park Avenue, good evening. Um, I was surprised to hear that there's the, uh, the empty lots were, were sold. I was under the impression that they belong to the city. I just learned that they were sold in an auction. Um, to hear that they want to develop them into 20 units is definitely not my cup of tea. We already a dense district 
We are the oldest, one of the oldest parts of the city. But I have some questions for Miss Valerie. I would like to know if the zoning board has approval already for this redevelopment to happen. Valerie, unmute, please. I'm unmuted. Uh, let, I'd like to clarify, uh, 20 years ago, the city of Plainfield put properties that were in the historic Crescent Historic District in a redevelopment plan. What we are doing or what we're proposing is an amendment to this plan. So 20 years ago, these properties met the definition for blight and vacancy and all of those things. 20 years ago. So this redevelopment plan has existed that long. And what we're pro proposing is an amendment to the plan. So I just want to clarify that. So these properties, other than the one lot, 25, were already part of a redevelopment plan. Uh, so that has been going on for decades. It is nothing new. And I've had healthy discussions with the uh, Historic Preservation Commission in the past about uh, preservation of properties, as well as the need to turn some blighted properties into better properties, and which uplifts the whole area. What we are discussing is how to do that. Uh, my question was, the zoning board already approved what is yes. this proposed? 20 years ago, this plan was approved. I think she means the current proposal. Have, has, has, have the other boards acted on this yet? Uh, the only board that is to act on this is uh, the planning board. So, no, they have not acted on the amendment as of this time. I may be uh, able to add something to this. Uh, the property was owned in the 70s by somebody that wanted to build a an oxford house a halfway house there mm -hmm. and they wind they wound up losing their zoning fight about it in mm -hmm. fact it's a reported new jersey case and then they let the property go for taxes it wasn't worth them paying their taxes any further um, at some point after that the tax liens i believe were purchased by some private owner and again, nothing happened and they let it go for taxes a second time. The city has to auction off properties like that once in a while. It would be illegal to just sit on them because it's unfair to all the other taxpayers when nobody's paying tax on this property. So that I hope that clarifies the history. Uh, no, I, I have kept more or less uh, <coughs> educated on those lots because at one point we have proposed for that to be built to, to be a park because of the density we already have and because we have many, many children in this area and we don't have any playgrounds. So we thought it appropriate that it would be nice to have a park with a playground for the children of the area. That's one. And my other question is, given the fact that the Crescent Historic District is not only locally designated as a historic preservation district, but a state designated district. Don't it's they have on the to national do... register too, isn't it? It is a state registered district. So don't, don't they have to go through the approval of the state? No, not, not, not for something like this. Okay. And my other question would be, what are the incentives that the city is giving to this developer? Tax credits? Any incentives? Can Ms. Valerie answer that, please? Well, this, the city is not given, giving any tax abatement of such, uh, incentives for this particular property, nor has the owners asked for that. Okay, and then my, I have two observations. <clears throat> you mentioned that the tax, the tax assessor goes to the houses 
on annual basis. Uh, when we bought my house, our house in 2005, uh, 2005, we bought it with a certificate that said this house was a four family house. Then when I came to the city to do some paperwork, I was told that the house was two offices, two apartments. Uh, as of, I let it go and we use the house. Mainly it has been used as a one family house. Now I have my daughter that is downstairs in the apartment. And January 22nd of this year, I sent a, a tech, an email to the tax assessor asking to please clarify to me how do they have the city, how do, how do they have my house registered? It is February 23rd, I have not received one single answer. So I think that just kind of gives you an idea that the tax assessor doesn't reach out to, to, to homeowners as much as you think they do. And it will be, I think it will be a good thing for the, for the city to go and find out what uses do we give to the houses, not only on the historic districts, but everywhere, everywhere in the city. We have a lot of development going on. We have the Muhlenberg, we have on the West End, we have on South Avenue, we have, I think we have on, um, by the police department. I hear, I hear or I saw something going on. So what is, what, what is the, the, the idea about having so many apartments, Ms. Uh, Ms. Valerie? Oh, I am unmuted. Okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of the uh, tax assessor, if you believe your property is incorrectly classified, you should correct that. Because I tell you that the zoning officer who's part of my department or anybody else, if you go to do something, they're going to use the tax assessor record. So you got to get, if it's incorrect, change it. In terms of... Um, the the mix of uh, single family homeowners versus uh, apartments. Uh, we are trying to change that mix. Uh, currently, the uh, city of Plainfield's tax base is predominantly single family homeowners, eighty percent. And in order to begin to stabilize taxes for single family homeowners we want to bring in some more commercial properties. So that's the idea behind that. I had a redevelopment community forum in 2019. I probably should have another one and um, just really talk about why it is that we do what we do. Let me just add to that. The, uh, in that neighborhood, the records of what were the houses used for and what can they be used for now is a tangled, complicated mess because of things that were done badly 50 and 60 years ago and people who get permits for something and then five years later they change it but they don't tell anybody. Um, I have wanted to do an aggressive attack on illegal uses for a long time but it would cost the city so much money just on legal fees that that's not going to happen. But one by one, without a doubt, uh, errors should be corrected. Okay, next person on my list is John DeMarco. Um, it's 932. What I'd like to do is allow about another 10 minutes of questioning and then stop. It's, we just can't, can't go on all night. I want to leave some time for the commissioners to state their uh, advice, as the code puts it now that we've heard all of this, and then we'll take five, and then after that, we've got two more cases on tonight. So John, go ahead, please, name and address for the record. John? Not working. Um, Aliqua, can you bring up the next person, please? I see Jen Johnson on my list. Hello. Hi, name and address for the record, please. Uh, Jen Johnson, 816 Third Place in Plainfield. Uh, a lot of my neighbors have spoken tonight, and I live around the corner. 
I'm taxed as a three family. I've lived in my house 17 years as a one family. There's two other big houses on my block where that's the same case because it's not very easy to change your house status uh, with the city. So I'll, I just pay my taxes. Um, you guys don't live in this neighborhood. You do not see the actual density. You're doing nothing to alleviate density. You're not increasing or building a bigger school in our neighborhood. There's no open space. And you're going to put 20 units in an already overpopulated place. I don't understand how that incentivizes anyone to buy a house in our neighborhood. There, there's no investment by putting crappy apartments around the corner does not make my property or my neighbor's property values go up just because there's people there. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see Wayne next. Well, I saw you for a split second. There you are. Okay. Name and address for the record, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Wayne Oliveri, representing 946 Madison Avenue. Uh, I wanted to say that Gary said he was a Jersey guy. Not only am I a Jersey guy, I'm a Plainfield guy. I was born in, in Middleburg Hospital. I went to St. Mary's School, Troop 36, Eagle Boy Scout. And I, I grew up on Spooner Avenue and Essex Street um, back in the 50s. And... Uh, continued around and came back full circle uh, a couple of quick things when these developers buy these auctions they, they buy the buy the land at auction was it specified that it was in a historic district i'm assuming it was i'll, I'll put this to valerie on mute uh, yes <laughs> okay. you know you know it seems to me and you know i'm just going to shoot from the hip here guys everybody's being so nice and very politically just just doing it right let me just tell you something it, 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 it's all about the money everybody mr martini represents somebody who wants to make a lot of money and the way they do that is they put in 20 units where they damn well know that it's the wrong thing to do and shame on you valerie for even considering backing that up and that's all i gotta say it's all about the money it's all about the money it's just all about the money not about us not about Plainfield. because if you like Plainfield, you know damn well all right, that's all right, sorry. I'm sorry, but that's what I had to say. Okay. Uh, next is Brian. Unmute, name and address. Uh, Brian Monroe, 313 Franklin Place. Um, my husband and I, we moved here in 2009, and we bought probably one of the largest houses in Plainfield, as most everybody knows, because I think just about everybody in Plainfield has been here for one event or another on Franklin Place. Um, our big deterrent for buying this house when we were looking was the 48 unit apartment building that sat across the street from here. We didn't want to move on anything on Wachung, and we sure as hell didn't want to live on Franklin Place. However, it was the only thing that really kind of fit the bill for what we wanted and it was in our price range. Um, what scares me about this whole redevelopment plan is that you have Abbott Manor, Bamber Brooks Mansion, Grace's Church that has an empty lot, a parking lot on First Place, an empty lot on West State that backs up to Abbott Manor that are all could be subject to redevelopment plans that nobody has even talked about. And why is it that Crescent Ave Historic District should be subjected to something that these other historic districts um, shouldn't be subjected to. Also, what Valerie isn't telling you is that one lot from this uh, plan that was designed in I don't know, 20 years ago, one lot was only decided to be five apartments. The other end lot was three apartments and the middle unit was either a one or a two unit. So now you're taking what was approved to be a nine unit and pushing it to be a 20 unit. You can find that right on the website. Um, so yeah, this is, this is very disconcerting that we have, you have the Van Brooks mansion that sits on over three acres of property that the owners have been trying every which way to sell it. So what they'll do is they'll end up selling it to a developer. The developer will say, well, I'll take the, the big mansion. I'll hack that off. Then we have all these outbuildings. Valerie's going to say, we can put this in a redevelopment plan and we could put 40 units here because we have three acres 
and four outbuildings. You have Grace's Church, that's got that whole side lot. Okay, we can put more apartments there that's on that historic registry. You have a parking lot that belongs to the Crescent Ave Church, and we all know that the Crescent Church hasn't been doing very well for a very long time. So when that building goes up for sale, I'm sure that parking lot's gonna go up for sale too, which is also going to be subjected to a redevelopment plan on this 197 plan. And then you have the empty lot that used to belong to Abbott Manor that's also not for sale yet, but I'm sure that's due to be for sale. That also is subject to a redevelopment plan when somebody goes before to buy it and says, hey, I want to put 20 units here as well because it's, it's about a quarter of an acre and why not? You know, you did it on, on East 9th and First Place, West 7th. Like, it, it's just you're not setting a precedent by doing this. You're ransacking a neighborhood that wants to improve itself and by adding 20 units on this tiny parcel is completely absurd. You're detracting from anybody to ever want to move on that block to actually take these houses and convert them back to single family, such as we've done with two already in this neighborhood and plan to do more. However, with your, with your horrendous plan to put 20 units, why would anybody want to live there in a, in a high dense neighborhood? You should be glad that my house sold and John Stewart's house sold because the other deterrent for John Stewart's house was the apartment building across the street that the city should have never allowed in the apartment building next door. And yet you're doing the same thing in another neighborhood. This needs to be stopped. Go elsewhere, keep your stuff downtown where it belongs, stay out of our historic districts, stay out of our single family neighborhoods. We don't want you here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can we move John DeMarco up because he evidently didn't uh, didn't get didn't stay in line before? All right, John, can you hear me? He doesn't seem to have audio capability. I don't know what to do with him. There can you are. Now? Not can very well. Now? Okay, great. That's better. Name and address for the record. My name is John DeMarco. I live at. 940 Glenwood Avenue in Plainfield. I've been a resident since 1985. When I first moved here, the Crescent Avenue District was a beautiful, flourishing area. Then, out of area, buyers purchased the houses and all let them run down. With we're just breaking up on areas in these beautiful historic districts. It's called uh, his, the Victorian, the Victorian city of Plainfield. We don't need boxes type housing in these areas. You can't park there now, let alone with 40 units or 20 units. There's other places that you can put these kind of houses. And we don't need them in the historic districts. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilman McKenna, can you stick to just a minute or two? Absolutely. You know, I just want to point out that that when a redevelopment plan is done by a municipality, it can take many months, four, six, eight months, and, and uh, uh, Bill, you can attest to that, for a developer to step forward, be interested, develop a plan, submit applications, etc. There is a developer who is interested in this, and that's why we are backing into this. Tw lots 24 and 26 were city owned, 25 was not city owned. All three are now owned by a developer. A developer has a plan, an idea, and that is why the bulk standards have been adjusted and presented as a redevelopment plan amendment because they will come forward within 30 or 60 days before the planning board. The redevelopment plan will be approved or not, but likely approved. Um, and then their site plan will come before them. It'll just magically appear as if they stumbled upon the perfect fit for their plan. So, I, I, and again, I have said publicly, I don't have a problem with backing into a redevelopment plan for a, a 
development that fits the community. I have a problem redevelop backing into a redevelopment plan that is not transparent and does not fit the community. And this does not fit Crescent. Crescent needs to go back towards what it was with an adjustment for time, but it does not need this density. So I appreciate the second comment. Thank you, Bill. Okay. There's two more people who want to speak. I can only give you maybe like a minute and a half each. Mark, you go next. Uh, Mark Malinowski. I'm from 825 Third Place on, in Plainfield. Um, my question and my concern is the um, not so much the parking, but the traffic on West 9th. Um, since living there, I, I have a view of the corner of Third Place and 9th from my home. Since living there, I have seen three car accidents at that intersection due to speeding. Um, cars fly down 9th Street. Um, these streets were designed in the 1800s for horse carriages, not speeding Ferraris. Um, the other problem I would see is also the crime element because it is a transient neighborhood. Um, just within the past two weeks, we had a shooting just outside of these properties. Um, Ms. Jackson, would you like to speak about that or address that um, aspect of it? Because this is a quality of life issue at this point. Um, we've bought these houses with the, with the aspirations of returning them to single family homes. And, and now we're being inundated with apartments, crime and traffic. And it seems it's being just for backhanded development. Comments on that, Ms. Jackson? Unmute. Unmute. Okay. okay. Uh, I have a couple of comments uh, because nothing about what we're doing is backhanded. I have already acknowledged early on here that we had a conceptual plan review from a developer with uh, the chairman and the vice chairman. So, and that was months ago. So I've already acknowledged that. I also have taken down the following issues or concerns. So we are transparent. Uh, when we did the other redevelopment plan, we came before the Historic Preservation Commission when we did TODD South. So the issues I've captured, density, traffic, parking, what is the floor area ratio, preserve and improve the streetscape and open space. Uh, so those, I do believe, rest with the redevelopment plan. There are some design issues and engineering issues that are part of the site plan. And the planning board cannot, if a site, if this redevelopment plan is approved and someone puts in their site plan application, the first place they're going to be told to go is HPC because they have to get a certificate of appropriateness or if they don't get that they can't be heard by the planning board and if there are quality of life issues i would recommend uh that you we begin to deal with the appropriate city officials about those quality of life issues so that if there's crime then we need to address those quality. We have a quality of life task force in the city. And if you want to e email me about quality of life issues, I will see to it that the task force begins to address that particular area. So I just want to go on the record uh, is that our redevelopment plan doesn't fix everything. What the redevelopment plan does is propose uses and bulk standards what what can be permitted uh if you want the development to look like a house in the in the neighborhood then that's up to the hpc to work out with a site plan application so i just want to clarify you know, because nothing is backhanded. That's why we're here. We're giving you the opportunity to raise your concerns and for us to consider those. Okay. 
I, I've got to call an end to uh, public comment right now. It's, it's 9.48. Um, what I want to do to finish this matter up, it's time for us to articulate our advice. The word advice is what it's in the code for the planning board in light of what we've been hearing. Um, I don't think there's anything that requires a vote from us. Rather, everybody can express their advice. And in the interest of uh, doing it quickly, I'm going to start. I had my doubts about whether this really was a, a suitable place for a redevelopment plan in the first place. I've decided it is. It's actually a perfectly appropriate use of the redevelopment statute. The mere fact that there's three small lots and that's, that's obsolete is probably enough reason in itself for me to say that. Um, the design, we're not at that stage yet and everybody concedes we've got, we get to make the same kind of ruling on uh, design issues, a certificate of appropriateness as we do on regular applications. But this case will come back to us for that purpose after it's at the planning board. The maintenance of that streetscape with, again, with the blocky houses that are somewhat similar in size and dimension is crucial. And it would be easier for us to do what we're doing right now if we had a more detailed plan before us, but alas, we don't. I think it does have to go in this sequence. I think the density is way too high. Um, usually in zoning fights anywhere, you know, you get an applicant that asks for the moon far more density and then they know they're going to wind up with in the end. And then the negotiation starts. So I don't really have a problem with that. Um, I would say that rather than four dwelling units per acre for this particular location, I would go to six, maybe eight, would I go to 10? Probably not, but I'd be willing to look at a specific plan because when you know how many floors you've got, you can play with how many bedrooms are, on, are in your units. Is it going to be one unit taking up an entire floor or are there gonna be two or what? The other uh, changes from the bulk regulations are mostly pretty trivial. Um, I don't have a problem with them, except for the impervious coverage. 60% is way too high. And what that reflects is the parking lot. But that brings us back to a density issue, namely parking. I don't want people who live in this place to be parking on the street. It is way too dense already. The way to do that is to limit how many units are going to be in the dwelling and perhaps the size of the units. Um, I could see the, the board granting a parking variance later, but we're again, we're not at that stage yet. But the concern I have most of all is that we can't go beyond the purpose of planning that uh, we undertook in this city 25 years ago, in which I've been fortunate enough to have a pretty top role in ever since. We downzoned this neighborhood. We don't want through third and fourth units in what was a single family home and maybe two family is not too terrible. So uh, the main thing that would interest me is the number of units. Everything else flows from that. It's too many, but it's not too much to at least talk about. One other thing that's very serious. I've taken the position that Deviating too much from the regular zoning that applies to this location would be susceptible to being stricken down by the courts because it is what we call spot zoning. You can't just decide one property, we're going to let you do what you want with it, even though everybody around you has very different restrictions. I actually researched this today because I knew there was not a case in New Jersey that uh, that says this yet, whether spot zoning is or is not a live concept when you're dealing with a redevelopment plan rather than a regular application under the zoning ordinance. 
I found one old trial court decision from over 50 years ago, which is before the, MU, the municipal land use law. And I found a couple of unreported cases since then, none of which are binding and all of which are very distinguishable based on what the facts were in those cases and what the proposal was. I I'm not threatening it. I am going to be on the city's side because I have to be. But I think there is a serious likelihood that litigation will result if something too dense is approved by the planning board. So I think it's better to restrict it now. Density, six to eight units, everything else is what I said. We're going to go around now. Anybody that has, uh, hopefully all of you, have comments that you want to put on the record, this is the time. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a few comments. Also, I'd just like to uh, ask Mr. Martini to send his raw data to April, so that April will follow up with that so that we can make more sense of that map uh, somewhere down the road. Um, I just want to clarify the discussion, and I think Valerie and I ended up having the, most of this discussion about, gee, design is not an issue here. We're, the HBC will do design later. But I think Councilman McKenna really uh, clarified it when he said that if you allow 20 units, this density on this on this lot, which is what they really have shown us as the, if you look at what they propose conceptually using every inch, that's what you're going to get. And if you allow them to have the 20 units, if you allow them to have that density, then when they come to us, it is going to be extremely difficult to make them conform to good historic design. That's the connection between uh, what we're doing here now and what we may be doing here in the future. This, this very overdone density will, in effect, in some ways, tie our hands. Now, I know Valerie has said, well, you can just turn them down. Um, but, you know, if something has to go there, fine. I'm not against having something be there. I'm really not. Uh, but giving them this high, high density is just disastrous from a design, trying to get good design for the historic district. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize too, I agree with some of the comments made by um, the citizens is that this is a very bad precedent. You know, this, developers are going to start looking around town, as they already are, uh, for lots. And if the city is going to help them out these this way and give them all this density and all these other things they want, just for the goal of development, it's very, very short-sighted. And I'm not, I'm not saying, Valerie, that your office doesn't have, you know, good things at heart trying to move the city forward. Of course we do need development. But, uh, you know, we're destroying one of our best assets, and I wouldn't like to see this be um, a precedent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sandy? Well, I totally agree with both Bill and Larry, which is um, the, the density is impossible to square with what's there now. And what's there now is what we wanted to be there now, thank God, that has survived this long. Um, the precedent of, of just opening the door to a developer who needs to make the biggest buck is not what we want to have as our legacy. So I would support rejecting the density. It's a shame we couldn't have turned it into a park, but if something has to go there, then let it be something that fits. Mario, unmute. Um, I don't have any more comments at the moment. All right. Uh, Gary, unmute. I know. I just got to get there. Um, you know, hearing everybody, and, and I was w willing to listen and to see where this was going. Um, my very, very strong point at the moment, if we don't stop it now, it's not going to be stopped, period. And, and all, all the politics and all the um, verbiage that goes on you know, always leads to protect the investor and not the homeowners. 
All right, and I made that point very clear when I when I spoke before. This is not about the homeowners. This is not about the homeowners. This is a hundred percent about the investor, and how the investor benefits by by working the town to get to this point. And I am, I'm very adamant. I was adamant about this when it first came up months ago. That you know to make this presence of of having an investor come in on three lots is opening the door for everything else in any historical district. Our historic district will disappear if this goes through. That's how I am. Bill? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, not surprisingly, I agree with you. Larry, I agree with everybody. I'm concerned about the density and uh, everything that contributes to it. Uh, nothing really else to add that you haven't already said. Just would not like to see my neighborhood ruined. Okay. Gail? I was very happy to hear about so much history that the um, citizens have talked about regarding this area and learning so much more about it. And this is a conversation that we're starting to have about this particular area and these parcels of land. And hopefully we can get to an area where we're more comfortable in the amount of dwellings that are gonna be there. And I do think that uh, the chairman is right. We're looking for at least half of what is being asked for, if not much less, and to really fit when the design point comes up to really understand that you have to fit into the neighborhood and look for that to be the goal. The numbers now, the dwelling numbers now, as you can hear, it probably will not go any further because of the fact it's too high for this area. That's all. Thanks. John? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything being, that's being said. Um, I've lived in here, this uh, city, for 12 years. I have seen a steady and impressive improvement in historic districts. I'm amazed at how they've upgraded in 12 years. We don't need this. Um, this is a sellout, and it's going to ultimately make a few developers who make money and leave this city uh, make money for them, but it's going to be to the detriment of all of us who live here. Everyone else is going to lose money while the city panders to a few developers. This is spot zoning. It's, it's, it's a sellout. It's nothing more than a sellout. I'll do everything I can to fight it. Kirk. I don't have any comments. I'm just not sure how it's mathematically possible to even put 20 dwellings in this area. Well, I guess it's something like this. If you have two buildings and each one has three floors of housing, you could have, I don't know, three units here, three units here, two units on the first floor, and then that's where you would be at a density of 20. But the lots aren't being combined, right? Uh, it could be combined any which way the applicant wants it, but the total is what is most significant. Okay. Okay, Barton, anything? I, I do not have any more comments on this, thanks. All right. Uh, Valerie, I guess that's what we're achieving tonight. Now, based on, from the recording that's being made, um, we will put together a report that I will sign that in, includes all the things we've been talking about and I don't know, might be able, we should be able to do it well in time for your next planning board meeting. So I'll make it a priority and that's where we're going. All right, everybody, what I'd like to do right now is take a break for five minutes, then we're coming back.